have an emergency. Today on Rescue 911, a runaway log. And Harold says, my hips broke, and he says, I'm crushed inside. Puts a lumberjack in danger. Harold's dying, and there's nothing I can do for him. Emergency crews go out on a limb on Rescue 911. John Horseman and Harold Gerber had already been hard at work for hours in a remote forest outside Bellingham, Washington. They had no idea that it might be the last time they would ever work together. I like watching trees fall down. You watch them fall, and they, they hit the ground, and they kind of bounce around like a fish out of water. And as long as you keep your eyes and ears open and, and watch out what you're doing, it's really not all that dangerous. We started work about 6 o'clock, and we worked straight through. I was cutting on timber on my strip, which were, is where I cut trees down and, and buck them into log length. And Harold was working his strip, doing the same thing. And we worked for several hours that morning. He fell a tree, and then he jumped up on it, and he bucked it into log lengths. They'd already been working for six hours that day when Harold noticed a log up the hill from him that looked unstable. He looked back at it, and he realized that log wasn't... There was nothing holding it there. It was on a steep side hill, you know, about probably 65% slope, and he, he looked at that log up there and thought, this doesn't look safe. Harold tested the stability of the 3,000-pound log. But when he found he could not move it, he returned to work on the slope below. John could not hear Harold's whistle or cries for help because he was wearing earplugs. I was gassing myself up, and as I gassed it up, I looked back down the hill, and I didn't see Harold or where he should be or anything else other than his saw and his hard hat. So I pulled my earplugs out at that time to listen down, and as I pulled my earplug out, I could hear him say, John, Harold! get me out of here. Okay, Harold, just hang on. I'll be right there. I was real scared for him, and, and so I dropped everything at that point. I was afraid when I first seen him, and Harold says, my hips broke, and he says, I'm crushed inside, John. I can feel it. Oh, no. John had enough training in emergency first aid to realize the seriousness of his friend's injuries. His pelvis was, it was either crushed or broken, and there was blood seeping from the head of the meatrum at that point. And I knew then how serious his injuries really were. And with the logs being unstable and rolling around, if they roll, that top log would just crush him to death right there. So at that point, I run to my pickup and called for help. And I picked up a truck driver who was working on a different logging site not too far, a couple miles away from us. And I said, it's your ball. You have got to get me help as quick as you can. Harold's dying. And there's nothing I can do for him. Hey, you guys, somebody's hurt over on John's side. Head on over there. While John continued to radio for help, three loggers set out to run the three miles to the site where he and Harold had been working. A trucker in Bellingham was the next to pick up John's urgent call. He quickly got the basic information about the location of the accident and ran to the nearest phone to call 911. 911? Yes, uh, uh, I was listening on CB on Channel 7. And the guy was looking at one of the ambulance and a uh, helicopter. There was a logger with a pin uh, on Canyon Lake Road.
first information was immediately relayed, and three ground medical units were dispatched to the scene. Can you pass the word along that med flight will be in the air in just a few minutes? Yeah, will do. Good. Can you wait, sir? Thanks for helping. Yep. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. There's no doubt he was in shock, and when he when he was laying there, you think he says, "You think I could possibly die?" And I told him, "Harold, I don't know. You're gonna die, believe me, but you better not die right now." It took about an hour to get to the scene by the rough and winding logging roads. The first unit to arrive was the Welcome Volunteer Fire Department, led by EMT John Heiser. We're running out of time, and it's what they call, a, the surgeons call the golden hour. You know, the first hour after some major trauma like this, they want that individual in the hospital whose best chances of surviving are within that first hour. And we just about used that up getting there. Worried that the log might roll back onto Harold again and kill him, the loggers decided to risk moving him. Harold was still conscious and alert, but at that time, John Heiser was coming around the corner with his stuff and the spine board, and then we, all we had to do then at that point is lift Harold and set him on the spine board and help start coming real quick after that. Paramedic Tony McQuinn was next. We found Harold talking, but he was in severe pain. He was very pale. And he didn't have a palpable pulse on his wrist, and any movement at all, he would wince or yell in pain. He had lost a lot of blood because of his injuries, so he placed uh, what's called mass pants on him and inflated those to stabilize his pelvis. He needed a surgeon immediately. By road, it could take an hour and a half to get Harold to the hospital. By helicopter, it would take only eight minutes, and every minute counted. At that point, I was demoralized. I just, like losing your losing your best friend, basically, and that's what it was. That's how I felt at that point. It was more than I could handle at the time and, and try to keep myself calm. And then uh, when they finally put him in the helicopter, at that point, there was a real loss. Something was being taken away from me, and, and I didn't know if Harold was still going to be alive when I got to the hospital to see him. Harold was flown to St. Joseph Hospital South Campus in Bellingham. Dr. Marvin Wayne headed the emergency team. Whenever we hear of pelvic injuries, a patient can literally bleed to death because of bleeding in that area of the body. So with the extent of the injuries that he had, with the crushed pelvis, with the torn urethra, with the collapsed lung, had he not been extricated and stabilized in a timely manner, Mr. Gerber very well might not would have been with us here today. I feel fortunate. I feel lucky to be here. But apparently, the way I look at it is apparently it wasn't my time. After a month and a half of bed rest, Harold's fractured pelvis has repaired itself. Life with his three children and his wife, Janet, is almost back to normal. He's a very good-hearted person. It's one of the reasons why I married him. He always comes in the door happy. You can be madder than hell at him, and he'll come in the door happy, and it'll wreck it. <laughs> Though Harold's recovery has been remarkable, he may never be strong enough to return to timber cutting. What's the next step? <clears throat> Get healed up and continue to march on, to, on with life. I would do anything for Harold. And whether or not Harold ever comes back to work in the woods again, old Harold and I will still be going fishing and we'll still be going hunting because we don't work on the weekends. Excellent.